Thank you, Peter. And I think what you've said is really important. And I know that what we're all seeing, if we look at the, the data and what the research is telling us, is that young people need more opportunities. There needs to be something between only going to college and only going to work. And people need those options um, to get the skills, to get the great jobs that, that Peter's talking about, which are important. What we know also is that kids need opportunities in school when they're there today. Teachers need resources. People need more than what government funding is giving them. And our next speaker is going to talk about how that is being made possible. But instead of me introducing him, I'm going to let our friend Stephen Colbert do the work today. Thank you. When I came into this classroom, we had 30 desks, 30 chairs, a teacher's desk. That was it. Public school teachers spent $1.6 billion of their own money on classroom supplies. I was a history teacher at a high school in the Bronx for five years, and it just occurred to me that there were people out there who'd want to help teachers like us if they could see exactly where their money was going. Donors Choose is the greatest, simplest idea. Teachers go to the website and put up materials they need for something they want to teach. You, as a donor, choose a school, choose a project. And you can fund part of a project or the entire project. It is magic. With Donors Choose, you know exactly where it goes. Every dime goes exactly to that project. And you hear directly back from those kids and from that teacher. Um, I use it for a lot of English and reading. But people also do field trips or a special project that maybe they need a piece of technology for. We're moving into the age of technology and the only way my kids really get those experiences are really at school. To have someone out there give them books, the feeling that they get, they feel like somebody in the city cares, somebody in this country cares about me and, and my future and my potential. And that's, that's a powerful thing. Hey there, good morning. Uh, thank you. We're going to be talking about crowdfunding and how it might change the education system. And I, I bet that more than half of you have already participated in this movement. Raise your hand if you have backed a project on Kickstarter, funded a microloan on Kiva, supported a campaign on GoFundMe, or have given to another crowdfunding site. All right, it looks like it's not just more than half. It looks like it's nearly everybody in this room. That is awesome. Um, DonorsChoose.org began years before crowdfunding was a word. So I want to give you the inside story of how it began. And then I want to explain to you how crowdfunding generally and DonorsChoose.org specifically could help to change our education system itself. One last show of hands. How many of you had a teacher in high school who you feel changed your life? OK, good. Abs nearly as many as have participated in crowdfunding. I, uh, I had a teacher like that myself. His name was Mr. Buxton. Here he is. He was my English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman in high school, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to, to any adult. If he approved or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. If, if I asked him a, a question on Wednesday, He'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he really had. He made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And thinking back on it, it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher, like my cousin Eli, who's here, who's also a teacher. And when I started uh, teaching in the Bronx at a high school called Wings Academy, I saw right away that my students didn't have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom. When I went to high school, we went on field trips into the woods, we had graphing calculators to do trigonometry, the supplies to do just about any art project we did not want for anything. But when I started teaching in the Bronx, I saw firsthand that all schools are not created equal. My colleagues and I would spend a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils, and then we would talk in the teacher's lunchroom about books that we wanted our students to read, a field trip we wanted to take them on, art supplies that we needed for an art project. What I wanted for my students most of all was Little House on the Prairie. Those of you who only saw the TV show might think I was dumbing things down, but uh, those of you who read the book will remember that Little House on the Prairie is a gripping, unsentimental account of pioneer life. I will talk all morning about how awesome this book is. Um, and my students, even those who had never left New York City, they loved this book too. But the, system, the school system was not about to underwrite 
uh, uh, copies of that book for my students. I would get up every day, I would go to the copy shop open 24 hours a day in the, in the morning, and I would make photocopies of that day's section of Little House on the Prairie, which probably violated a number of copyright laws. And as I was making copies, I started thinking about those books, those art supplies, that field trip that my colleagues wanted for their students, and I just figured there must be people out there who'd want to help teachers like us if they could see exactly where their money was going. So using pencil and paper, I drew out a website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests, and donors could choose projects that they wanted to support. For $2,000, a programmer who had arrived from Poland was willing to uh, turn my pencil and paper drawings into uh, software. The site he created was so rudimentary that uh, to process a donation, I had one of those black boxes that you see at the grocery store when they can't swipe your credit card, where you punch in the credit card number and the dollar amount and send it over a telephone line. It was like PayPal, but, uh, but by hand. And it was a really good thing. My students were helping uh, to get the site off the ground. Then I had to get my colleagues to try out the site and post the first projects. Now, I don't know how it is at your own workplaces, but at the high school where I was teaching, if you wanted to get folks to do something, you gave them free food. And what you see right there is uh, my mom's roasted pear dessert. She would do these roasted pears with um, orange rind and apricot jam and spices, and she would roast them and juices would flow all between. Let me tell you, they taste something delicious. So I brought my mom's dessert, 11 of those pears, into the teacher's lunchroom. And as my colleagues prepared to pounce, I said, hold up, there's a toll. If you eat one of these pears, you gotta go to this newly created website and ask for whatever it is you most want for your students. Propose the project that you've always wanted to do with them. Sounded like a pretty good uh, deal, and it took like two minutes for my colleagues to scarf the 11 pears. And then they proceeded to post the first projects. Uh, the uh, health teacher, she ate the dessert first. She wanted to do a pregnancy prevention project with her students, for which she needed baby think it over dolls, which are life size, life weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and uh, need to be fed and show a teenager what their responsibilities would be uh, where they'd have a kid. The English teacher, he wanted to get his students ready for the SAT, so he requested test prep books. Art teacher, she wanted her students to do a wall-to-wall -wall quilt with each student sewing a square, and for that she needed fabric and thread and needles. Those were three of the first projects up on our site. My aunt, who's a nurse, she funded the first project, but uh, I didn't know any more donors to fund the other 10 projects that my colleagues created after eating those pears. Uh, so I funded them myself, which I could afford to do because I was still living at home with my parents, and they weren't charging me any rent, so I could spare some of my teacher's salary to, to fund those projects to see if it could work. And because I donated anonymously, my colleagues mistakenly thought that the website actually worked. <laughs> and that there were all these donors on the site just waiting to fulfill teachers' classroom dreams. So that rumor spread across the Bronx, and teachers started posting hundreds of projects, projects that needed a whole lot more money than what I could afford by living at home with my parents. And I was in a really tough spot, not knowing how I was going to get those projects funded. My students came to the rescue. They could see the potential of this experiment to change their lives at school. And I think they also felt bad for me. So they volunteered every day after school for about three months to spread word to potential donors. They addressed and compiled 2,000 letters by hand to people all over the country, telling them about this website where someone with $10 could be a classroom hero. We sorted the mail ourselves to get the cheapest postal rate. Every desk in my classroom was piled high with letters. And then we carted uh, all these letters to the post office and crossed our fingers. It worked. My students' letter writing campaign generated $30,000 in donations to projects on our site, and we were off. That was 16 years ago. Uh, as of today, 72% um, of all the public schools in America have at least one teacher who has created a project request on our site. Two million people and partners have given nearly half a billion dollars to books, art supplies, butterfly cocoons, 3D printers, field trips to the museum, technology, all sorts of resources that students in low-income communities need most. We never dreamed we'd cite, my students and I never dreamed we'd cite numbers like that. We certainly never dreamed that crowdfunding would become a movement. 
Uh, today, there are now hundreds of websites where uh, people on the front lines can identify a need they see, propose a project they want to do, secure a microloan for a small venture they want to start, and then anyone, no matter the size of their wallet, can now be a patron, a financier, a, a philanthropist. I'll, I'll wager that uh, within just a few years, a real percentage of our country's GDP will come from crowdfunded projects and ventures. And now that it's become a real movement, uh, understandably, people are starting to ask tough questions, such as, does crowdfunding let government off the hook by allowing private citizens to step in where the system is falling short? Is, is crowdfunding generally, and DonorsChoose.org specifically, a Band-Aid solution because it addresses symptoms rather than causes of educational inequity? Where, where's the beef with crowdfunding? Is there anything here that really could help to change the underlying system itself? This morning, I want to respond to that skepticism because I think that there are three ways that uh, DonorsChoose.org could have an impact way beyond the books, the art supplies, the technology, the resources that we deliver. The first, uh, I think, relates to Peter's talk, um, and it is uh, a way for DonorsChoose.org to help edtech entrepreneurs, inventors, makers introduce new products and services directly to teachers across the country. Right now, if you are an education entrepreneur and you come up with a new invention, a new service, a new product, uh, you are faced with a big challenge of breaking into the K-12 educational industrial procurement complex. And you are faced with needing to hire uh, a team of salespeople, of lobbyists, to kiss the rings of school district procurement officials in hopes that they'll be persuaded uh, to adopt your product. But DonorsChoose.org can enable those same inventors and makers to circumvent that complex and introduce new inventions directly to classroom teachers. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, right now, on our site, we just launched a match offer for the Three Doodler pen, which is uh, a three-dimensional pen that actually secretes filament as you draw. So imagine being able to draw something in the air that takes physical three-dimensional shape. If you're a teacher in a low-income community right now putting up a project requesting the Three Doodler, all donations to your project are matched. We did the same with the open source underwater robot called the Open ROV, uh, where a teacher who wanted to show their students underwater exploration and robotics could get donations to their project matched. This is a way for uh, these two companies to introduce uh, uh, 3D printing and underwater exploration directly to teachers and students without needing to hire a group of salespeople or lobbyists. Second way we think that we could help to change the system itself is by opening up all of our data. 400,000 teachers have created a million classroom project requests. And within those projects, within the, the data that we have opened up, we've got statistical significance for the kinds of resources that our teachers most need. We can reveal what books middle school teachers think are most effective at getting kids hooked on reading. Spoiler, it's Diary of a Wimpy Kid. We can uh, reveal what technology devices California high school teachers think are most effective uh, and, and most needed as expressed by the projects that they're creating on our site. We can show you what is on teachers' minds and ultimately enable policymakers and budget makers to listen to classroom teachers and hear what those teachers on the front lines are trying to tell the powers that be about what resources are most vital, what activities are proving most effective, what topics are on teachers' minds. And I'll give you just one example to show the value uh, of this data and, and how we would do well to listen to these teachers. In Flint, Michigan, months before any government official had raised a flag, there was a teacher on DonorsChoose.org posting projects saying, I don't trust the local water supply. I'm asking for water bottles to give my students purified water because I don't trust uh, what I see coming out of the faucet. Uh, so I think that there are all sorts of uh, policy-making and budget-making implications that come from the data that we have opened up, and we can give classroom teachers a seat at the budget-making table. Third final way I think we can help to change the education system itself that I want to share with you is um, by becoming an altruistic currency for rewarding educational attainment. I'll give you the, the origin story of, uh, of this idea. A few years ago, we were lucky enough to win the Google Impact Award, and it came with a grant that we used to underwrite donors choose classroom funding credits for teachers in low-income communities who launched, 
and help their students pass math and science AP courses. The crux of it was that uh, for every teacher who launched a math or science AP course, for every one of their students who passed that AP exam, they, that would unlock $100 of donors choose classroom funding credits for the teacher to spend on their own classroom projects or on their colleagues' projects. So if you're one of these participating teachers and 20 of your students pass the Calculus AB exam, you get a $2,000 funding credit to spend on your own classroom projects. Now this might sort of slightly resemble, look like, smell like, sound like merit pay, but by switching the currency with which the reward is paid to classroom funding credits, we've actually created something totally different that speaks to a teacher's heart rather than to their wallet, that enables students to say, you see that classroom library? I got that for my classmates when I passed the Calculus AB exam. That field trip we went on yesterday, we made that possible when five of us got through the biology AP exam. This is an approach which can be taken with all sorts of educational outcomes. I'll give you just one example of a corporate partner of ours, PwC. They have been a huge champion of financial literacy projects on our site. That means they do a match offer for anyone giving to a financial literacy project. They've done an innovation challenge to identify the most breakthrough financial literacy projects on our site. They have also offered DonorsChoose.org classroom funding credits to teachers who get their students through a financial literacy curriculum. So that is how we began. Those are a few ways uh, of how we think we can change the system itself. And I leave you with a party favor. Each of you should have a $50 DonorsChoose.org gift card in front of you to experience what we've just been talking about, to spend on a classroom project that might be in the town where you grew up, requesting a, a book written by your favorite author. Uh, it might, you might choose to support one of the many life essentials projects that teachers are creating on our site where they request jackets for kids who are coming to school cold or nutritious snacks for kids who are coming to school hungry. You might decide to spend your donors choose gift card on a project reaching new immigrant students to show those kids that many of their fellow Americans are pulling for them and rooting for them. I hope you will see when you spend that gift card what is possible when you and a dedicated teacher get together with no gatekeepers standing in your way. Thank you for your time.